three, two, one. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. I see we have a few schools just hopping into our Zoom chat, and we're just going live to YouTube. So good morning to those of us joining us from YouTube. So nice to have everyone here today to learn about some school actions that we're taking for the environment. Um, we're super excited about this really full event, so I'm not going to take a ton of time. Um, but just to get started, we do have a little bit of trivia that you are all welcome to participate in if you'd like. Um, you can just type your answers in the chat, or if you just want to say them within your class, that works as well. I know sometimes our classes answer like C, D, B, A, so many answers. That's totally fine. Um, but it's just a good practice for us to use the chat before we get started. So my first question is, which of the following foods does not grow on a tree? And I'm going to apologize. I know as a teacher, you're not supposed to ask not questions. I tried my best. There's a lot of not questions in my trivia today. Um, so do we have guesses about which of these you would not find on a tree? Peanuts, cinnamon, cashews, or did I try to trick you? And these actually all grow on trees. So go ahead and see if you uh, can ask your class what they think. Um, type it in the chat, type it in the YouTube chat. We have our friend Sarah uh, on YouTube uh, moderating that so you can go ahead and answer there. And I do see we have a couple answers coming in. We think maybe uh, peanuts or cashews. We're getting a mixture of answers. Um, we'll give it maybe 30 more seconds, see if everybody has a chance. And this one is a bit of a tricky one. I've, I've put a couple in here that I wasn't even sure of before this, so. Okay, so the correct answer for this one is actually A. Peanuts actually grow underground. You have to dig them up. Cinnamon is actually a bark, and cashews do grow on trees. They're part of a fruit, so this one was actually A, peanuts. Okay, next one. Which of the following is not a common gardening tool? So I think some of us joining here today might have school gardens at home or uh, school gardens at school or gardens at home. So which of these would we not find in our garden? Um, gloves, spate, trowel, or shears? Hmm, a bunch of weird words in this one. Hey, I see some of us are guessing shears or a spate. I actually see in my picture, one of them is maybe given away a little bit. So if we're looking at my PowerPoint, I don't know if anybody's going to guess A. All right, so lots of us are thinking spader shear. So gloves, yes, obviously we all know gloves are a gardening tool. Um, a trowel is actually a little shovel. And shears are actually what we use to uh, cut pieces off of plants. So the correct answer here is actually B, spade. A spade is a tool. That's like a big shovel, but not spade. I tried to trick you with the spelling on that one. Okay, I think I've got two more. Which of the following cannot be composted? Is it plastic, table scraps, dead leaves, or newspaper? I think hopefully this one wasn't too tricky for you. I hope we have a few composters in the group here. Which of these do we not put in our compost bin? Okay, yep, I was right. <laughs> these are very easy. A, 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 yes, we do not put plastic in our compost bin, but the rest of this stuff all can be green matter, brown matter, that can all go in our compost bin and make delicious soil for our plants. Okay, and I've got one more. This one's the hardest one. How many living things are found in a pinch of soil? Now, I know that's a little bit more than a pinch. I did my best to find a good picture, but just a pinch of soil, how many living things? So if you could zoom in really close and see all those little organisms. Is it about 10,000 or the number of blinks that you would do in one day? Is it about 100,000 or the number of stars in our Milky Way galaxy? Is it about 500 million or the number of breaths you take in a lifetime? Or is it 7 billion, the number of people on earth? So I know these numbers are really big. I tried to give you guys an idea of what these numbers actually represent. How many living things do we think is inside that little pinch of soil? So I'm seeing in our chat, we're getting lots of answers, lots of yelling answers. Yeah, D, D, C, C. Okay, so we think it's a big number. Okay, this one is actually kind of crazy. It's actually D. There's 7 billion little living things in that pinch of soil. So lots of little bacteria that are living together. It's like a little gigantic community. So the number of people living on earth, if you zoomed into that soil, that's how many living things are in that soil. Awesome, thank you very much for participating in my little practice chat, my trivia. Um, hopefully this kind of gets our brains thinking a little bit about uh, school actions that we can take a little bit about, uh, maybe gardening as one of our options, composting as another. Um, because today we are celebrating school actions for wildlife with the Canadian Wildlife Federation. 
So thank you very much for joining us. We're gonna officially get started now. So I'd love to begin by acknowledging that I'm joining from a Miss Ken. This is colonially known as Edmonton, Alberta, and it's on Treaty 6 territory. This land has been the traditional meeting grounds, gathering place and traveling route to many groups, including the Cree, Suto, Blackfoot, Métis, Diné, and the Nakota Sioux for time immemorial. I would also like to acknowledge the Indigenous people of all the lands that we're on today, as we're meeting on a virtual platform that covers many different territory, territories that we each call home. So acknowledging our traditional lands that we reside on is an important first step in the reconciliation process so that we might be able to improve our relationship with the environment and the diverse people who have served as protectors of those lands. And we're very lucky today to be able to look deeper into our connection with the land and explore how we can help give back to the earth in a meaningful way. So I want you to all kind of keep that in the front of your head or in the front of your minds as we, we go through our presentation today and really think about that connection that you, you have to your lands and think about how you can maybe improve that relationship a little bit after today's event. Um, I would like to say uh, welcome to all of these amazing schools that have signed up today. You can see we've got tons of schools across Canada, but we also have lots of our global schools joining us. So I hope you're able to see your class up there. You're able to um, get a little bit of recognition for, for taking the time out today to learn about this important topic. And just a reminder about our agenda, our presentation might be pretty full today, but we will hopefully have a little bit of time at the end for you to share. So if at any point during the event you think um, you might want to share on camera, just go ahead and uh, give me a message in the chat or raise your hand and we can go ahead and let you guys um, go on camera and share from your classroom. Now I see in our Zoom, I don't know if any of our schools are allowed to have video today. If you aren't, that's totally fine. You can also participate uh, just in the chat, but if you are able to, you're welcome to uh, turn your video on and participate that way. Now I would like to go ahead and welcome our guest speakers. So Kaylee Setter is from Calgary, Alberta, and she is the Experiential Education Manager, Manager at the Canadian Wildlife Federation. As part of the education team, she works to connect people with nature through hands-on learning activities and conservation projects. From the mountains to the grasslands, she's collaborated, collaborated with conservation researchers and scientists across the country to educate people of all ages about Canada's wildlife, habitats, and real-world conservation work on the ground. So welcome, Haley. Thank you so much, and hello, everyone. It's so great to be here with you today to chat about how we can take action to support wildlife. I'm just going to share my screen, and hopefully everybody... That's perfect, great. everyone can see it. Great. Fantastic. So my name is Kaylee Setter. I work for the Canadian Wildlife Federation, and yeah, we're here today to talk about what actions we can take to have an impact for wildlife in our communities and around our schools. So before we get into that, I just want to ask the question, why do our actions matter? And if you have thoughts, feel free to throw them in the chat, but I think a great way to look at it is like ripples in a pond. So you know when you take a pebble or a stone and you throw it into the water, how it makes ripples that get bigger and bigger and bigger, and they kind of kind of go off into the distance. That's sort of what it's like with our actions. Um, our actions are like ripples in a pond. And those the impacts of what we do and the choices we make can be really far reaching and even beyond what we think they might be. So what we decide to eat and how we um, interact with the environment, um, they can be really positive impacts. So they can sometimes be negative impacts. Uh, the other thing is our actions can really inspire others and lead to bigger ripples. So that stone, when you throw it in the pond, it just makes a little impact, but it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And so sometimes the things you do can have a huge impact just by inspiring other people around you, your family, your friends, and others in the community. And what's really important to remember too is taking action helps us feel good. I think sometimes it can be really scary today because there's a lot of really big issues and things that we're worried about. Um, there's a lot of good science and research that shows when we take action and do something about it, we, we don't feel as scared, we feel better about ourselves. So if you're worried about something or you notice something that's going wrong in the environment, if you take action, you'll feel better and you'll feel more empowered. Uh, and that's an important thing too. So it's really important today, uh, and it's a really good topic to talk about um, with all of you. 
Now, there are around 80,000 species of wildlife in Canada. That's a lot of wildlife. And when we say wildlife, we're talking about um, animals uh, of all sorts that live in wild settings. So not maybe domestic animals like pets, like cats and dogs, but you can see on some of these pictures here, things like butterflies and fish, bees and polar bears, um, turkey vultures and foxes and freshwater turtles. So there's an amazing diversity of wildlife across the country and across the world. And I think one thing um, that we have to remember is that there's also a lot in our own areas. So learning about what's in our backyards and what's in the areas we live in, we might have some really cool species in Nova Scotia and some really different ones living in Regina or different ones in Vancouver. So all these diversity across the country, but in your own part of the country, there's e even an amazing diversity of wildlife. So why take action for wildlife? Why even bother? Well, there's a number of reasons, and I just want to highlight a few for you. The first one is healthy wildlife is actually an indicator of healthy habitat. So habitat is the, you know, food, water, shelter, space, the places, the ecosystems where animals are living, humans are living. And so there's a term for that, and it's called an indicator species. Uh, in indicator species, they uh, give us clues about changes in the environment. So there's just a couple of pictures here. You'll see frogs. Frogs are a great indicator species because they tell us about water quality. If frogs aren't in um, water, we don't see frogs. We start to think, okay, what's going on here? Is the water um, polluted or is, is it not very good? Because often frogs will be the first ones to leave if the water quality is bad. So instead of having to spend a lot of money to like test the water quality always, sometimes scientists will just go out and look for these certain species as indicators to say, how healthy is this habitat? So frogs are indicators. Bats, bats can be really good indicators of light pollution. So how much light there is at night. If there's too much, you won't see bats. So it gives us a good sense of, is there too much light pollution in an area? And worms, speaking of gardening, worms are really good indicators of healthy uh, soil. So if you see worms, you know that soil is doing really well because it's extra healthy. If you don't see worms, maybe we start to think that um, maybe that habitat or that soil is not doing as well. So they tell us a lot of information uh, about the overall health of the environment. Another really good reason uh, why to take action for wildlife is wildlife are such an important part of our ecosystems. They play these really critical roles and often they do it and we may not even know that they're doing it. Uh, I think many of you probably know about pollination. So a lot of insects um, will pollinate plants, especially bees, and that's really important uh, for food. We wouldn't have fruits and things if we didn't have pollination. So that's a really important job that wildlife is playing um, that impacts us directly. Another one is seed dispersal. So has anyone ever had a pet, maybe their dog and they've gone out walking or maybe you've gone out walking in the fall and then you notice all these seeds and burrs sticking to your, your legs and your shoes and they're really sticky. It's because seeds are designed um, to latch on to animals because they, they think, well, I can't move, I'm a seed. But if they have the right mechanism to latch on to an animal passing by, that animal will carry that seed to another place and eventually that seed will fall off and then they can uh, grow. So it's, it's plants who don't move rely on animals to help them disperse. Um, other things too, like wind, but birds and deer and even our dogs and things, they help and even people can disperse seeds. So that's an important role that wildlife play. Uh, and then germination, a lot of seeds, especially native plant seeds, they won't grow. If they just fell on the ground, uh, they would have a hard time growing because they have all these waxy coatings to protect them. So actually by eating them, so birds will eat seeds, it helps break that down so that when it ends up in the soil, it's ready to germinate. So a lot of seeds, if you got it right off the plant, it wouldn't be ready to go in the ground. It's designed to be eaten by an animal. And then when it comes out the other end and gets planted, then it's ready to grow. So they play an important role in germination too. And then the final picture is turkey vultures and other animals that are decomposers. That's a good keyword I bet a bunch of you know in the food chain about decomposers. 
it's important because if we didn't have decomposers, we'd have all of these materials just left out, not breaking down um, because some animals and different insects and microbes break things down back into soil. That's that nutrient cycle that allows new plants to grow. So you can really start to see how important wildlife are to the ecosystem. And then again, why take action for wildlife? Well, they also prov provide so many benefits to people. And there's just a few listed here, like clothing, um, traditional clothing, uh, many indigenous groups and wear uh, furs because they have the insulating properties. They're really important culturally. Uh, many of us have natural materials that uh, are made uh, up our clothes. We also rely on wildlife for food. So if we eat fish and different animals, then we rely on them for our own needs. And of course, recreation. And it's really valuable um, just for their intrinsic value because it's so fun to do bird watching or maybe whale watching if you're on the coast. Uh, there's so much enjoyment that can become from seeing wildlife in the environment. So, so many benefits across the whole board. So keeping that in our mind, all the reasons why we really want to support wildlife and take action for wildlife, and then the question becomes, well, how? How do we do that? And I'm really excited to share some examples today from real schools across Canada, things that they came up with on their own, uh, things they wanted to do to support local wildlife. So let's check out some really cool examples from schools across Canada. Uh, the first one's birds. So I don't know how many of you have birds in your area. I bet most of you have seen a bird or two flying around maybe your school or community. So birds are a great place for many of us to get started if we want to support wildlife because they're in urban settings and rural settings. So here's just a couple examples. Um, Fort Fraser Elementary School in BC. So they had a gully uh, area on their school grounds that they wanted to turn into bird friendly habitat. They're like, this is gonna be a spot for birds. So they built and installed 40 nest boxes. So places where the birds could uh, create their nests. And then they went out one step further. They didn't just make the boxes and install the boxes. They also recorded how the boxes were being used and by which bird species. So were certain birds preferring certain boxes? And so they were learning and they thought, well, how come some boxes weren't being used? Maybe it was the direction they were installed. Maybe the wind was pointing at them the wrong way and it was deterring the birds. So they did a lot of observation um, and they even submitted some of their observations through a citizen science app called iNaturalist where all of the students could take what they'd seen coming to their birdhouses and share that with scientists across the country who are studying birds saying, this is what we saw in our, in our schoolyard. So really cool mix of like construction and, and critical thinking and, and sharing the data, which we can all benefit from. Um, another one in Ontario, Grandview Public School, recognized birds need habitat and, and that means places to live. So planted some trees and shrubs to help attract birds and other wildlife. They also did birdhouses. They had some bird feeders that they made. But even beyond that, too, they thought, we want to get the word out. They engaged the families of everyone to come during the summer and help take care of the plants. So it wasn't just a school project. It became a whole community project where everybody came by to water the plants and take care of them when nobody was at the school. So it became bigger even than the school. And then one final one on birds, uh, Dorchester Consolidated School in New Brunswick. They said, right, we're going to do a beach cleanup because that's a really important area that we're in. A lot of migrating shorebirds take big journeys from the north all the way to the deep south, and they do little pit stops on the way. And one of the areas where they had a big pit stop was near the school. So they thought, we're going to clean up the beach to prepare for the arrival of these shorebirds. And more than that, we're also going to create some signage to help encourage people who use the beach to be more aware of how to do it safely during migration season. And I know the pictures are a bit small, the one in the middle, that's an example of one of the posters or a couple of the posters that they made to try and raise awareness about these um, animals that are passing through and keep it clean for them. So in really good you know, awareness projects, creating habitat, these are really impactful things that all of these schools have done for birds. 
And so um, we have lots of resources what are the, on our website for the Canadian Wildlife Federation, but another really simple project. If you are really excited about doing something for birds, this is one you could do uh, right away, even at home. You can make window stickers uh, to put on your windows. So sometimes birds, um, they can't see the glass and they'll fly and they'll run into it. And a really easy fix for that is just to create stickers or markers so that birds know that that's um, not a see-through thing uh, and so you can see here that we have these instructions but you can just use glue and a couple supplies and make really fun uh, window stickers that you can put on your window to help make sure birds know where they're going so even simple actions have big impacts it's that ripple in the pond um, a small thing that might take you 15 minutes or um, maybe an hour can have a really big impact for birds and then, of course, bird feeders. I'm sure many of you have done something like this before where you can create your own bird feeders, whether it's out of pop bottles or make little um, bird ornaments. Uh, you could do some research and see which bird seed is best for certain birds in your area because not all birds eat the same things uh, and learn a bit about some of your local birds. So tons of projects that get you involved and maybe get you inspired to maybe start small and grow it, grow it from there. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is pollinators. I think most people know pollinators like bees and butterflies. We talked about the important role of pollination. Schools are doing amazing things to support pollinators. Uh, at Evergreen School in Alberta, the students hosted a bee night to teach families about the importance of bees and pollination. So they made paper bag fact books. They did little public service announcement videos talking about the importance of bees. And then they even created little bee baths, which you can see pictured in the middle there, um, because bees, like all wildlife, they need those essential components of habitat, food, water, uh, shelter, and space. So they do need water sources. So they did an activity with their family making bee baths. Uh, another well, the English Montreal School Board, a couple schools, they created five designated wildlife habitat areas to help uh, attract pollinators. So they planted native plants, they figured out um, what plants um, the pollinators liked and they planted them and even cooler they didn't just plant them but then they started learning how to collect the seeds from the plants and we talked about how sometimes the seeds you can't just put right back in the ground um, but they learned how to save them dry them out how to treat them and then they were going to use them um, to raise money through a community fundraising project so they were going to put them in little packets and and give them out to the community and try and raise some money um, that way. So what a cool way to, to take some the garden they planted and get the community involved as well. And then uh, finally for pollinators, uh, Terry Fox Elementary School in Ontario uh, actually teamed up with local seniors to create a poll pollinator friendly garden at Briere Village. That's a local seniors home. So it was intergenerational. They went to the seniors home in their community and said, we'll help you build a garden at the seniors home. And so the seniors all the, you know, lots of grandparents were able to give a lot of advice and share their knowledge. And then all of the students came in with all the energy to dig up the holes and get things done. So they worked together in their community to create a garden at the local seniors home, which is pretty cool. Uh, just checking the chat uh, question. How do you know what seeds can go right back in the ground? Well, this is not the easy answer, but it takes a bit of research. So it's an excellent question. And, um, and the best way to know is to learn more about your local native plants. We have some really amazing resources on the Canadian Wildlife Federation page that talk about native plants and what grows in certain areas. Um, but you can learn a bit about the seeds because you can imagine naturally seeds evolve to sit out all winter on the ground. So sometimes it's a matter of them being out all winter so that the wind and the snow and the rain breaks the seeds down and then they're ready to grow in in the um, in the spring so a lot of the time native seeds you plant in the fall rather than the spring and they take that whole time but if you don't do that there's a lot you can learn a lot about how to do it you can put them in the fridge um, get them wet break them down but it takes a bit of research so that's an excellent question um, and another question, we know that bees are really good for the environment, but we're super scared of bees. What would we, can we do? Yeah, absolutely. And I think a great project could be to talk about um, bees and think, why are people scared of bees? It's because they think that they're wasps, 
because wasps and bees are different. So maybe you could teach your community about the difference. Um, maybe talk about um, how to attract certain pollinators or, or um, how to, you know, address if there's like lots of wasps. There's some really good techniques um, that you can have to kind of defer certain pest animals from being in your area. But a lot of the time, I think there's misconceptions about bees. So maybe busting some of those myths and looking at why are we scared of bees and is it rooted in actual facts like allergies that might be a really good reason to be afraid of bees or is it because we think that they're gonna hurt us and we can have a conversation so a really good conversation starter i have a, a little something i i could add to that too i um i don't know if anyone's ever seen in my office but i do have like a little insect collection here and um, the elementary schools around me used to borrow it to bring in because they said that having the students be able to like look up close at the insects in like a safe way made them feel more comfortable around so them. So good. Could, like seeing them, you know, in like a safe space or, you know, you can catch them and, and watch them. That way, you know, you, you, you get a little bit desensitized to them. I think that's so good because it's so like we don't know if we're scared of what we don't know so the more we learn and maybe we can see them up close i see um grand woodland says they have bee houses at the school so we get you know it's not it's not as scary if we know more about it so really good ideas everyone and i see some good ideas being shared around aquatic projects and a couple questions i will talk about aquatic projects here too so here's just a few more pictures. I mean, gardens and bee facts. You can see um, all the cool things that some of the schools are doing to support pollinators. Now, aquatic animals. And I saw a question, uh, Muriel Martin, uh, do you know why there would have been large fish die off in the spring? Or is this something that often happens? We were on a class walk in the river valley and saw lots of dead fish. That's really interesting. And you know, it's really great that you out, went out on that walk and that you were thinking critically and asking questions. Why might this be happening? Um, I don't know the exact circumstances, but often it has to do with oxygen levels in the water. So if, I don't know if it's a moving river or if it's like a um, slow moving or if it freezes over, but sometimes if the water's too shallow or the ice is too deep or it doesn't melt, um, there's not as much dissolved oxygen in the water. And so then fish don't do as well. We talked about indicator species. Fish are a really good indicator of how healthy the habitat might be. So that might be a really amazing jumping off point to start thinking about why are fish having a tough time in our local neighborhood, maybe engage some experts and talk about it. It might result in a really interesting project that your school could do either around you know, education about fish, or maybe the actual area they're living in isn't as healthy. So that'd be my thought is a lot of time if it's fish, it's either the temperature of the water because they're very sensitive to the temperature or the amount of oxygen that's dissolved in the water. So great question. But the good news is there's lots of really important projects you can do to support fish and aquatic species in your community and around your school. I think what's important to remember is maybe we don't have fish in our school we might not be right on a lake or the, or the ocean, but remember that everything that flows ends up in a river, in a stream, in a lake, goes out to the ocean, so we're all connected. So even if you're not right near a water body, you have to remember that when it rains, it washes things out that might end up there. Uh, so across Canada, um, on Earth Day weekend, we had a bunch of high school students who hosted shoreline cleanups in their community to help uh, keep garbage from making its way into waterways because everything that kind of comes off the streets might end up on the, the beaches and end up in the water and then maybe wildlife are eating it or getting caught and tangled in it. So shoreline cleanups go a long way in helping um, keep wildlife safe and keep the water healthy too. Uh, in Vancouver, BC, we've got a day coming up every year. June 8th is o Oceans Day. So they decided to celebrate Oceans Day by hosting an ocean-themed school festival, kind of like the Bee Day. They had a giant drawing uh, scale model of a whale in their school parking lot. So the big compound, they, the students drew it to scale so everyone could get a sense of how big a whale is because some of us will never see a whale. They live in, in, out in the water. And it was a great point to say, this is what how big whales are and how much space they need. And, and they invited everyone at the school to wear blue too, to share their love for oceans. So sometimes your action can be raising awareness. It can be getting people involved, getting them aware of some of the animals in your area. Uh, and then in Calgary, uh, 
there was a focus on conserving water at home and at school. So there's a program called Yellowfish Road, they where you paint fish silhouettes by street drains to raise awareness about water pollution in the community. So it's just a reminder that yellow fish, oh right, everything that I put down the drain, maybe from washing my car or something, uh, that'll end up in our waterways. So it's a visual reminder for everyone living in your area to maybe be mindful of what we're putting down our drains. Fantastic. So that's just a few ideas of aquatic, you know, projects. There's a lot of ways and a lot of what we do on land impacts what happens in the waters too. So we have like uh, on our website, there's a bingo sheet of different things you can do to engage with oceans. You can see pictures of cleanups happening or planting plants to help prevent runoff. So when water goes and flows, like rain comes down and flows on cement, it goes really fast and it has a lot of force and it'll carry a lot of things with it. If you can slow the water down by planting plants and rocks, it'll filter it and absorb the water as it goes. And so it won't have as much force to carry things out into the ocean. And then also, I think we all know what it's like if you live in the city when it rains really hard and there's just water everywhere. It just helps um, prevent flooding too. If you can have these nice spaces that absorb water like wetlands and, and plants, uh, then you won't have crazy runoff sweeping things out into the, our waterways. Um, Uriel says, we do a school ground cleanup challenge between the grades, the heaviest garbage bags per class wins. I love that, a little healthy competition. I'm curious, I wonder how heavy the bags are, but I bet you probably pick up a lot of things. Um, and that's a great way to make sure that waste ends up in places where we can make sure it's processed, whether it's recycling, making, you know, collecting bottles and things that can be recycled, or sometimes if it goes to the landfill, at least making sure that can be processed rather than it ending up somewhere where it could be a danger to wildlife. So great job. That's an amazing action. How about bats? Bats are another species that uh, schools are taking action for. So Elwick Community School in Manitoba, they constructed bat houses, which are a little bit more complicated than bird houses. They have multiple chambers because birds like to um, sometimes have their own house and they don't won't share bats want to be with a lot of other bats together so there'll be multiple chambers so a little more complicated for construction but you can buy them or you can get um, instructions to make them um, so i think in shop class and things people make them sometimes so they made a bunch of them and they actually went out and erected them on a stretch of the prime meridian trail because they knew that the bats were in the area they'd kind of done some research they knew there were bats i thought well we're going to make some habitat nesting structures for them they made them and they went and put them out um, where they knew the bats would be. So a pretty cool project because they constructed those from scratch. And then they can go back and monitor them too. Another opportunity to see, did we put them in the right place? Are the bats using them? Um, because it's not done just because you put it out there doesn't mean that it necessarily is going to work. Sometimes there's a bit of thinking and, and observing and saying, did that do what we thought it was going to do? So a great project for bats is to put up bat houses. Um, we also had a, a great mixed group of classes who took a master class uh, um, à distance, which is an online course for French students from uh, grade 6 to 12 from like Yukon, Alberta, Northwest Territories. And you think, well, what can people do if you're online? What can you do online to have an impact for wildlife? Well, they decided to raise money as a class, a chip in, and they all symbolically adopted a bat. You can see that picture of the stuffy to raise money for bat conservation because they didn't have a place they could all go out and put a bat house up. But they said, you know, we can support people who are doing research by doing a fundraiser. So they raised money and they got um, this bat adopted and that money will go to support research and projects. So that's a great thing, even if you don't have a space you can go to. And then in Halifax, uh, they, much like Bee Day and Ocean's Day, they had a bat night for family and friends. Um, where they shared facts about bats because there's a lot of myths and uh, misunderstandings about bats too so to help educate people so maybe they wouldn't be quite so afraid. And I see in the chat uh, there was a few people saying um, that they have bat houses. Uh, I see in Kelowna we have bat houses. We made them at the bat event last Halloween. Yay! That's amazing. Um, and then we also have one thing, we had an in-class dress as your favorite animal for Endangered Species Day. That's fantastic because endangered species need some extra attention. And a lot of people don't know that certain animals are struggling. And so if you can raise awareness and say, actually, 
we learned about these species who need our help, um, you help make sure everyone is aware of them and then we can take action together. Now, I think this is my last one because honestly, this is not exclusive. You can figure out what animals are in your area and come up with your own projects. But one other species I want to talk about are turtles, freshwater turtles, especially. Um, so in Ontario, there's a lot of freshwater turtles. I know I'm in Alberta. I think there's one species of freshwater turtle and it's at the very bottom of the province. So maybe you don't have turtles in your province. Uh, but in Canada, which is just outside Ottawa, some of the youth just decorated their sidewalks with some amazing chalk wildlife. And they put some fun facts uh, and the community as they were walking down the sidewalks then could learn about some of these local species. So it wasn't just in the school. It was kind of on the sidewalks around and a lot of people use the sidewalks. So they would stop and read the facts and learn about these animals. Thanks to all the students who went out and drew these amazing art pieces. Uh, another group in Ottawa is a bit older because this is a bit of construction involved, but they worked with a local conservation organization to build what's called turtle nest protectors. So when turtles lay eggs, they'll dig a hole and then they'll lay their eggs and then they'll cover it up and then they'll leave. And one of the challenges, especially for endangered turtles where there's not very many turtles left, is predators will say, great, I'm going to go dig that up. That's a great snack uh, to eat those eggs. And they, they can't defend themselves because they're just eggs still. So they create those screens, those big boxes, and they'll plunk them down on top of the nest. So when they go, um, the conservation organization knows, they'll know when the turtles laid eggs, they'll go out and put them on top. And there's room for turtles to get out underneath, but there's a screen on top, so wildlife can't dig it up and eat the eggs. So it gives them a chance to get a start so that they can hatch and then go, and they have a better chance once they've hatched in their turtles than when their eggs under the ground. So a really cool project that they built to help protect turtles. And then a final one, um, cars are a real problem for freshwater turtles because like a lot of uh, cold-blooded animals, they rely on the sun. Um, sometimes the roads are really warm, so they hang out on the roads or they're crossing the roads maybe. And so they do get hit by cars. So one of the groups of students said, well, we're going to make some signs. We want to inform um, our local community about like slowing down. Uh, the traffic, not driving as fast, being careful not to hit turtles on the road because that's a real, and what to do maybe if you see a turtle on the road. So just information to help inform people because I know you might not all have cars. <laughs> maybe you're too young to be driving yet, but your parents and community members, it's good for them to be aware so that they can make sure they're, they're watching out for turtles. Uh, I see a really great question that came in from YouTube. There are so many different things we can do. How do we decide what is most important or actually makes a difference? Yeah, it can feel so overwhelming. Okay, here's a bunch of ideas and you think, where do I get started? That is a great segue. <laughs> I want to give you some tips um, on how to get started. Um, but before I do, maybe I'll just make sure I check the chat. Is there anyone else that's doing anything really cool already? Um, are there things that people are doing at their schools or at home or in the community to support and help wildlife? I know like we talked about you. The kids are kind of brainstorming uh, and writing out, teachers are typing out their actions. I did have one I wanted to share of a local school. Something great that they did was they got master composters to come in, which is a group that probably exists in the city that you are, are each joining from, but they basically are really great at composting and come in and teach you how to compost and they taught the students how to make these compost bins and then those students went and taught other schools how to make the compost <gasps> bins. so they all had classroom compost bins so another cool example i love that you know what's great about that is then it's it's you teaching each other so it's not somebody coming in and say okay here's how we're going to do it it's all of the students saying here's what i've learned let me show you how and that's much more meaningful to hear it from people who are the same age as you sometimes. They know yes. that, oh, okay, I can do it because obviously every people, uh, they've done it too. Right, exactly, yeah. Uh, let's see, I see there's a question. Students here are wondering about development in their community and how they see less wild bunnies. They're wondering about the impact. Does it matter? What can they do? Great questions. And these are great questions to think about because obviously it's a balance, you know, people and wildlife live together. And sometimes, you know, we're going to have to find a compromise where, um, you know, we're not going to bulldoze down somebody's house um, because it, we need bunnies there. It's like, well, people live in the house, but where are the bunnies? So it kind of makes me think some of the questions, where are you seeing the bunnies? Where are you not seeing the bunnies? Are there spots still in the community that might be really important to, 
some of the wild animals and you know um, can we protect those areas or can we create new spaces for them so this is why I want to kind of head into like what where do you get started and what can you do um, so I'll just do that let me just check the TRC another one come in if students wanted to let other schools know about the projects that they are doing how is it best to share information great I'll touch on that too so tips for getting started and this is a bit simple like it depends on how big your project is and complex you can start really small or maybe you want to do something really big with the whole school but i always say when i'm talking to schools the first step is to learn about wildlife in your area and i see you all are already doing that you're starting to think i've noticed this in my community i've seen this animal i've seen this situation that's perfect that's the first step get out and explore your community like that school that has gone on the walk and noticed the fish what local species can you spot which are they so you see them there can you identify them are they low, like native to your area or were they introduced you know um, learn about that species first because we really can't do much if we don't know anything about them and you might find out a lot about um, what they're what the challenges they're dealing with um what problems they're facing and then you can start to figure out how you might help because sometimes there's people already working on it or there's resources available so the first thing is always that knowledge okay we really care about the fish what kind of fish are they where do they live what's their life cycle what's normal for, um, for them and then once you know more about them you can know maybe where there's a point to intervene and and take action in a small way or maybe in a bigger way so once you have an idea okay well we have this species um, that we want to help so let's say like it's bats we recognize we're really interested in bats and we want to help them and we've learned a lot about them and what they need um, and so you want to work together to brainstorm a plan and i think the best way is to just throw it all on the wall what are all the things you could do we could put up a bat house we could plant plants um, we could um, invite maybe some external experts in to talk about this or raise awareness in our community. Um, or maybe there's a bigger project already happening that you can join in and support. There's going to be a lot of different things um, that come up and some of them are going to be big, hard things and some are going to be easy, little simple things. So put them all on the wall. There's no bad ideas when you're brainstorming you know you could, it could be crazy wild out there put them out there and the rule of brainstorming is every idea is a good idea so once you've got your ideas on the wall then it's time to start thinking okay of all of the things we've thought about which one makes the most sense so then you start to think about well what kind of time do we have to do it are we only gonna have an hour or are we gonna do this all year long that might decide what project you're gonna do um, maybe you're thinking about, is it going to cost us money? Do we have to buy things? Do we maybe have to fundraise before we can even do the project? Or can we do it pretty easy and cheap right away? These are all really good questions. Do we have enough people to do it? Or do we have to get everybody else involved? Um, and that'll start thinking, okay, maybe one of those options we talked about, like maybe just to start for bats, you're thinking, okay, we don't have a lot of money or we don't have time. We're going to do an awareness project or oh no we have a bit more time to do it we're going to build and install a bat house and so you can set your goal then it's really important that you say this is what we think we're going to do um, and make it a what we call a smart goal make it specific make it something that you can measure and do because if it's not realistic then it's not going to happen if we're like we're going to save the bats by installing 500 bat houses and you think oh no that's too many bat houses <laughs> it's going to take too much time but maybe one or two and and maybe you want to research how many bat houses are needed first like maybe you only need the one right so decide on your goal and then then you can start about okay what materials and we'll get all the materials together and seek input because it's good to talk to experts talk to your teachers talk to experts get that information that's exactly what we do at uh, canadian wildlife federation too is we we do a lot of research and we ask the questions to see what information is already out there and you'd be amazed at how many resources are already available step three then it's time to make it happen so you got to assemble all your materials you can invite others to help out you know plan your day to do it and work together to execute your plan so if you have a really good plan hopefully then you know what day you're doing it you've checked the weather and done different things 
and then you can really act. But you got to be adaptable. Sometimes things might come out if, up if the weather changes. You've got to be willing to change the plan. But this is the point where you, you've got your plan. All you've got to do is execute it. Um, but it's not the final step. It's not just do the plan and then you're done. The last step really is learning from your plan. So how did your project go? Did it go the way you thought it went? Um, what went well? And maybe what didn't go as well. And that's really important because as I talked about with some of the schools, like say with the bat, you might put a bat house up and then realize, oh, it didn't um, maybe get used the way we thought, or we didn't see bats using it. Well, why is that? Maybe you pointed it the wrong direction or maybe put it up too high or too low. Um, and you can learn from that. And, and if you incorporate your lessons learned, then you can have an even bigger impact um, and make sure that the actions and the projects that you did um, actually are having a good result. So I saw there was a comment about starting a school garden. Are there next steps? We have a lot of really good resources on our website about how to figure out what plants you need and where to plant them and how, maybe how many. And then you can observe, I think the important part of this step four is looking and seeing what insects come to your school garden. Um, did you get a diversity or did you not see any? And then maybe you can plant different plants um, the next year because the color of plants matter, the size, when they flower. So there's a lot to learn and keep the project going. Uh, I see that uh, grade six class here started an indigenous species wild garden. That is so cool. What a great way to learn about not just about the plants, but about people, how people have been using the plants. Um, I know a lot of them are like yarrow, for example, is a really good insect repellent. So anytime I'm out in the field and I see yarrow, I always am like putting it on me so the bugs don't bite me. Let's see if I miss any others. Uh, if we want to start, so school gardens was one I saw come up. Uh, we've got, I'll just say, and I know it's, this is more for teachers, but there, we have a lot of resources on our website, tips to get started, instructions on how to build nest boxes, instructions on how to build bat boxes, uh, where to put them. Um, and of course, just reaching out and asking questions, um, sending emails and talking to local conservation organizations. They're always willing to give things to people. Um, it's just sometimes it takes a bit of research and stuff. And then finally, because I know we're getting toward the end here, I want to highlight to recognize all the amazing things that youth are doing. We also have an award. We have a Youth Conservation Award. And so every year, the deadline applications in January, um, people across the country nominate young people for awards. And it's to recognize all the actions that you're all taking to support conservation. Because it's not just scientists. It's not just government who's making these impacts, it's youth who are in their communities and, and finding, asking these really good questions that you're all asking, doing some digging and research, and then finding a project that they can do. And sometimes like those ripples, that project starts as one small thing, and then they start asking more questions and building the project until they become a real source of inspiration for other youth. So I know it can feel intimidating. There can be so much and not knowing where to start but as I said, kind of focus in on what's going on in your community and have a conversation. And I already see that here. You're starting to have really good questions and start thinking about what can I do? Um, and then when you get to that point and you need resources, you can always come see me and I'm happy to point you in the right direction. Uh, so with that, I'm going to throw it back to you, Rebecca. I don't know if I missed any comments, if you noticed any other projects people had mentioned in the chat or if anyone has other projects they want to share. It's so inspirational to hear what you're doing and for everybody else to hear what you're doing too. So, yeah, no, that's awesome. I think you caught everything. You're great at moderating the chat. I didn't have to jump in at all. Um, yeah, it was really great to see all of the like very different things that our schools are doing. And I do think um, just a couple of your slides did a really good job of showing us what counts as an action for wildlife. Cause I do think our schools do sometimes think like making a school garden and picking up trash are the only two things we can do, which is definitely not true. So, like, I know we are technically a couple of minutes over, but I think we're okay with going a little bit longer. So um, it's your last chance. If you have any last questions or last ideas you want to share, um, now's your last chance to pop those into the chat. Um, I do just have, um, I see Kaylee has put her information on the webpage. Um, we've had some questions about how we get things started and a couple of things that our schools wanted to try. So if you are, are hoping to do some of these actions in June here, um, that's a great place that you can go. I do also have one last reminder I wanted to share as well. Uh, one second here. 
Um, just our last event. So we do only have one last elementary event uh, this semester. We're almost done for the school year. So um, we've talked a little bit about some of the actions you can take. This focus is going to be more on the ocean. So if you want to learn a little bit more about different actions you can take specifically for the ocean, you want something to do for World Oceans Day, just go ahead and scan our QR code because we are getting together next week for our final event. And we're hoping it's going to be just as amazing um, and, and exciting as this one has been. Um, I don't see any last ones in there. I think we're good to go. So I just wanted to say thank you very much um, to the schools that were able to participate in the chat. That's awesome. You were able to do it that way. We're happy um, to be able to share this with you. And you had so many great ideas and comments and to our school joining on YouTube. Thank you to you as well. And thank you so much, Kaylee and the CWF. You guys are always so wonderful and so amazing. So um, thank you so much for such a great event. Thanks so much, everyone. We'll see awesome. you out there. I can't wait to see all the projects you get up to. Yeah, and send us some pictures. We want to yeah. see what you are doing. Send it to us. We would love to see what you guys all get up to. So enjoy the rest of your days. I know we're kind of joining from across the country. So morning, afternoon, evening. It was nice to have you. See you all later. Bye. There we go. Got them all. Good comments. There was actually a lot of comments. That's great. Yeah, they were really good. I it's so like I'm pretty sure in those like great.